Hello everyone and welcome to the premiere episode for Quick Fix, a show in which I take a look into film and television and offer my opinion on how one or two basic changes could be made to make it so much better. Episode 1 will be taking a look into the movie Hereditary. Hereditary is a horror film which gathered so much praise in the festival circuit that it was able to acquire a cinematic release. The buzz around the film was claimed to be one of the scariest films in years, and the trailer which was released to YouTube definitely supported that claim as it left many audiences disturbed and horror fans like myself eager to see the film. And there's no doubt that for the most part this is a brilliant film. But just like with films like Wonder Woman, the final act seriously falls flat and heavily softens the impact of the film. Hereditary opens with a funeral for Charlie's grandmother. While at the funeral, Charlie's mother, Annie, reads her eulogy and hints towards her deceased mother's struggles with mental illness. All the while, we see Charlie approaching the coffin to pay her respects. Charlie quite clearly has a number of mental illnesses, including but not limited to autism, which is made very apparent by her audiovisual tick by the clicking and her overall shyness. During the eulogy, we see her drawing, a technique used to calm yourself in highly stressful environments to prevent the effects of things like sensory overload or panic attacks. We also see during this scene her father, Steve, closing a sketchbook, preventing her from using her distraction method, which instantly tells us a lot about his character. That he doesn't understand mental illness and the small coping mechanisms people with them use to function better in society. But it also shows us that he wants his children to show respect at a funeral and in theory other important events also. Just the simple act of closing a book gave us so much information to his character. Also in this scene we have Annie saying this line. She was also incredibly stubborn, which maybe explains me. Hinting towards what the name Hereditary is in reference to. At this funeral, we also see warning signs to the film's biggest problem. While Charlie's paying her respects to her grandmother, there is a man in the back watching her and giving a very unsettling smile. A little later on, we see Charlie witnessing a woman spreading an undefined fluid across the deceased woman's lips. These are members of a cult, which I'll come back to later. Throughout the first act of this film, we see the family going about their lives and the strange atmosphere is ever present, and a feeling of unrest is made when we get our first glimpse of the real biggest problem of the film. Charlie is sat in her room when suddenly a tiny spotlight of blue light dances around her walls. For the time being, it doesn't seem like much. Possibly just her imagination acting up. But I'm not exaggerating in any way when I tell you that this is a demon king. Yes. Seriously. At the time this is happening, we see her mother seeking counselling to help better deal with her grief. But she rejects the counselling after the first group meeting. Later on in the film, we see Charlie's brother, Peter, who is preparing to leave for his friend's party. Annie pressures him into taking Charlie with him, and he reluctantly agrees. When they arrive, Peter leaves with his friends to go get high, leaving her on her own, with the sole instruction to eat cake. This cake, however, contains nuts, something which she is allergic to. Panic ensues as Peter races to get her to a hospital, but tragedy strikes when Charlie opens the window and puts her head out in a feeble attempt to try to breathe, resulting in her head making impact with a metal pole at high speeds. Peter, realising what has happened, he shuts down. He doesn't know what to do and stays reserved within himself. Slowly, he drives home and leaves the car with Charlie's body still inside, outside the front door and climbs into bed, hoping to wake up from this nightmare. The following morning, Annie wakes up to find what remains of her daughter. And we get what is quite possibly the most disturbing image I've seen all year. That image being the bloody decapitated head of this young girl swarmed by ants. The repercussions of this horrible accident is the isolation of Peter with his family and the audience. Following this incident, he barely appears in the film for a good half hour, and instead we're following Annie as she returns to the support group seen earlier in the film, only to leave before entering the building. She is however flagged down by one of the group members, a woman named Joan. Joan is the only person who Annie leans on to talk through her trauma. She blames her son and her husband is at a loss for words most of the time. The only person she thinks she has at this time is Joan. What's really interesting about this section of the film is the name Hereditary and its actual meaning. Mental illness, sadly, is an affliction which can be passed down from family members. Sometimes the symptoms won't appear until much later in life. Take schizophrenia or clinical depression, for example, which Annie clearly has as it's illustrated throughout the film. Or autism, something which Charlie is afflicted with, and based on the description Annie gives about her mother, we can reasonably assume that she had autism throughout her life also. We receive these amazing monologues from Annie about her past, and without even telling the audience, they illustrate through these stories clear indications of her struggles with schizophrenia and depression. One story involves her children asleep as she herself is sleepwalking. While doing so, she covers her children in gasoline and holds a lighter ready to ignite it, only to wake up moments before and came to her senses. She and Peter share a lot of parallel scenes, while they exhibit signs of clinical depression. 
Annie for losing her daughter and Peeper for accidentally taking her life. The both of them close everyone off from their lives and isolate themselves in a vain attempt to not break down and worry those around them. Symptoms we see in Annie are a loss of concentration. Since the start of the film she has been working as an independent artist and has been very focused on completing a project in time for an art show. After Charlie's death she loses her ability to focus on her work and ends up destroying everything in a burst of anger. Random bursts of anger can be another symptom associated with clinical depression. We also see difficulty sleeping, only ever feeling comfortable sleeping in the treehouse where Charlie loved to spend her time. A quick rundown of Annie's depression symptoms comes out as tiredness or loss of energy, difficulty concentrating, not being able to enjoy things they usually find pleasurable or interesting, a feeling of anxiousness, avoiding other people, sleeping problems, very strong feelings of guilt or worthlessness, finding it hard to function at work, loss of appetite and strong bursts of negative emotion. Now let's take a look at Peter. The first sign of his depression is made during the wake for Charlie, where the camera is framed as a point of view shot from him looking through a distorted yellow window into a room separate from the funeral attendees. Obviously, him keeping separate is due to a large portion, if not all, of the people at the wake, blaming him for Charlie's death and the camera is being used to show his descent into depression. After this point of view, the camera moves to the main room with all the guests. The guests can be seen in the foreground on either side of the frame, while Peter is pinned mid-frame in the background, only able to be seen through the yellow tinted window looking through. It's a masterfully composed shot, which illustrates his isolation perfectly. This is also paralleled with a sudden cut to Annie, lying alone in her bed, away from the guests at the wake, isolating herself as well. And then the camera cuts again later in the day to show Steve seeing the last guests out of the house and closing the door behind himself, leaving him isolated as well, despite the fact that his wife and son are still in the house. Other symptoms of depression we see in Peter are difficulty sleeping, with him seeing and hearing Charlie at night in his room, and having nightmares of being swarmed by the same ants which were found swarming Charlie's head. A quick rundown of his symptoms looks like a tiredness and loss of energy, sadness that just doesn't go away a loss of self-confidence and self-esteem, difficulty concentrating, not being able to enjoy things they find pleasurable or interesting, feeling anxious all the time, avoiding other people, feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, sleeping problems, very strong feelings of guilt or worthlessness, finding it hard to function in school, a loss of appetite, a loss of sex drive, a lack of personal hygiene and strong bursts of negative emotion. At this point in the film, everything is coming together nicely by a filmmaking standpoint, and it's rapidly becoming one of my favourite films of the year. So now I ask, what went wrong? Things begin to derail with the character of Joan, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. At first, she is introduced as someone for Annie to lean on, someone who has experienced similar trauma and can relate to what Annie is going through. This, however, is shattered, where Joan's true nature starts to peek through, which has begun with the introduction of horror cliche number 812, the Ouija board, which does in fact put Joan and Annie in contact with the spirit. Annie then takes the notes John gives her home and performs a ritual to speak with Charlie. Peter, desperate to earn his mother's forgiveness, plays along, while Steve once again proves he has no understanding of mental illness as he tries to stop her in a somewhat aggressive way, which only pushes her further over the edge. This scene would work wonders to develop these characters' personalities and further establish the theme of mental illness. But the impact of this scene with all of the clashing heads with the family members is completely removed because the film is no longer a deep dive into mental illness and is now a supernatural ghost horror film, complete with lazy jump scares and a plot that gets ridiculously funny. I literally left the cinema for 30 seconds so as not to disturb people who are still interested in this derailed story. And in that lies the issue of the film. Up to this point this has been a fantastically constructed insight into mental illness putting us in the minds of three different characters, all of who suffer from different levels of illness and trauma. Right from the very beginning of the film, we are hinted towards the illnesses the deceased elderly woman suffered, while also hinting at the trauma Annie suffered as a result of growing up in that environment. We also see a clearly autistic 13 year old child trying to cope with a situation she doesn't fully understand, while her ill-informed father mistakenly works against her coping mechanisms. All the while her brother has yet to experience any symptoms, but as discussed earlier, severe trauma can bring dormant illnesses to the surface. I haven't even touched on Peter's schizophrenia. As the film progresses, it's made very apparent that Annie has a grasp on her illnesses and hides them really well, the only indicator being her having no emotion in regard to her mother's death, which can be linked to a number of ailments, but given her daughter and her mother, we can assume that she is low on the autistic spectrum. But her grasp is broken upon seeing her daughter's mangled corpse, 
Never before have I seen mental illness demonstrated so perfectly in a piece of film. But it's all undone when you introduce the supernatural aspect. At the start of this video I mentioned two strange attendees at the funeral. Well, as it turns out, they, along with Joan and Annie's mother, were all members of a cult in worship to the demon King Payman. I am not joking. As it turns out, none of them have any real mental illness, and are instead possessed by the demon king, who makes them exhibit these strange behaviours. And I really can't think of a reason why. From what I can gather, Payman needs a young male human host in order to walk the earth to his full power and rule over the human race. If you have no idea what's going on right now, I do not blame you. What started out as a low stakes deep dive into the human psyche has literally turned into the enslavement of all of mankind. The switch is so drastic and the scenes that follow are so jarring, it's really funny. When the supernatural aspect is the centrepiece of this story, we learn that Charlie's spirit, or Paymon who is posing as Charlie, is anchored to them via Charlie's sketchbook. And when Annie tries to burn the book to lay Charlie's spirit to rest for good, her arm ignites in flames. So we now know that to burn the book will mean that someone has to die. Later on in the story, she is showing Steve that he and Peter mean more to her than her obsession over the ghost of Charlie and makes a show of sacrificing herself to destroy the book. Anyone with half a brain can tell what's about to happen. She burns the book and instead of herself igniting in flames, Steve ignites in flames instead. It happens so fast, it's so goofy and it's so predictable. I literally burst out laughing in the cinema. People don't understand how simple, easy it is to stop, drop, and roll. Oh god, this part's funny. You're probably thinking at this point, this story cannot possibly get more derailed, and you are wrong. The following scene has Peter waking up in his room and venturing downstairs to an empty living room where the smouldering corpse of his father lay, only to then be confronted with a wall-crawling Annie. Yes, she literally climbs the ceiling like Spider-Man and cartoonishly bashes her head against the attic door so fast, I swear it must have been a joke on the editor that accidentally made it into the film. Serious? But wait! There's more! Somehow, Annie teleports into the attic with Peter. It's not explained. She's floating in the air above him and it's still not explained as she runs what I think is a piano wire through her neck and decapitates herself while three naked elderly people smile and wave at Peter. Which causes him to cartoonishly run through the window behind him, crashing through it and landing three to four stories down face first with minimal injuries. It's literally a cartoon at this point. While he's on the ground, Payman takes full possession of his body. Peter then looks up to see his mother's decapitated body flying of its own accord into the tree. It's so out there, so random, and Peter's reaction is so downplayed and hilariously uninterested that I could not stop laughing in my seat and had to leave the screening, go into the hallway to laugh to my heart's content. Keep in mind, this is the final scene of the film, so there were people outside waiting to see the film for themselves. When I re-entered the cinema, I bared witness to the rotten decapitated corpse of Peter's grandmother, along with the freshly decapitated corpse of his mother, bowing down to an altar that sat Charlie's decapitated head atop. While Peter is surrounded by a dozen or so naked elderly people, worshipping him as the Demon King Payman. I wish I was making this up. Now that was the actual ending to the film. So how do we fix it? It's really simple. Get rid of the cult, get rid of the Demon King, and stick to the story about mental illness. The final act took a seriously creepy and scary subject matter and turned it into a joke. The ending to this film basically says, if you are mentally ill, don't worry, it's just the Demon King Paymon living in your household and you're destined to become evil. It's an embarrassing and really random way to end what was once a brilliantly constructed story. So how will this change affect the final act? Well first off, it won't be so incredibly funny, but on a more serious note, we will get a real resolution. Joan can still be a shoulder for Annie to lean on and work through her grief. She doesn't necessarily need to work through or even acknowledge the schizophrenia she's hinted towards having. And this will ground the film even more in realism, as people who suffer from such afflictions don't always seek help for it. They tell themselves it's something less drastic like stress or grief. We can see Annie learn to open up again, providing some character growth that was missing earlier in the film. When she first went to the support group after her mother died, she barely spoke and stayed very reserved within herself. She didn't return until someone else close to her had passed. Through Joan, she could have worked up the courage to go back to the group and open up about her daughter's tragic death. 
she could have a breakdown and do something which we haven't seen her do in the entire film and express her emotions, any emotion in public. It would be a great character moment and endear us to her much more. While this is happening we could have a parallel edit with Peter as he continues to isolate himself from everyone, his dad not knowing what to do on account of being very uneducated on the topic of mental health. And with this scene while cutting between Peter and Annie we can see one of them learning to overcome or learn to cope with their trauma, while the other continues to blame themselves and hate themselves for what happened. This scene could end with her beginning to talk about her son, but go quiet because at this point she doesn't actually know how she feels about him anymore. During the film there is an incredibly powerful scene at the dinner table where Peter and Annie explode at each other. It's the first moment either of them have expressed any real emotion since the funeral and it's one of the best scenes in the entire film. We can adapt this to coincide with the scene I just created, to let Annie get her negative emotions out in front of Peter and Steve, only for Peter to be hurt by her words and leave in tears. At this point one of two things can happen, either Peter leaves and Annie doesn't care, similar to how she didn't care about her mother's death. Or, after he leaves, she can have a chance to calm down from her anger. She can be overcome with regret and break down in her husband's arms in tears. She can have a chance to talk with Peter and they can reconcile their relationship, even if just a little, and together they can join that therapy group and work through their grief together. There will still be hostility between the two of them, which will probably never leave, but they are still taking steps to forgive themselves and forgive each other and be a family again. It's definitely a more positive message to leave the film on, However, this wouldn't be the end. Continuing with the parallel storytelling for Peter and Annie, the final scene can be each of them alone in their respective rooms, with a delusional vision of Charlie watching over them. On the outside, an onlooker like Steve will see they are tackling their grief, but no one knows about their real inner struggles with mental illness. And the longer this goes untreated, the more drastic and vivid their delusions will become. A final topper onto the idea of isolation these two share is that they both suffer from the same ailment, passed down onto him by her, but neither of them know that the other suffers from it. And in the end, the title Hereditary no longer is in reference to the spirit of the demon king Paimon being passed down throughout the family bloodline. Instead, it's in reference to the mental illness passed down from grandmother to mother to son and daughter, and no doubt to any children Peter might have in the future. It's a bleak ending which is left open, because at this point, anything can happen. It's definitely better than playing the shock value card so much that the only surprise left is how much longer you have to wait until it ends. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Quick Fix. If you have, please subscribe to A White Sunset and be in tune soon for some more episodes. Goodbye, everyone.